Start with uh, Chris from Georgia Tech. Thank you. So um, I'm Chris Valenza from Georgia Tech. I am a PhD student there. I work with Dr. Greg Durgan in the EMAG group, so I'm actually relatively new to software, period, besides just MATLAB. I started using GNU Radio about a year ago and had to learn Python, C++, and pick up on some Verilog that I had done back as a freshman. So primarily the reason I got into GNU Radio first was we, we develop RFIDs and RFID sensors that work at 5.8 gigahertz. And typically we've done a lot of our developments on FPGAs to, to do all of our baseband demodulation. And our project before I came in onto our lab was um, done on an FPGA, and it took the student about six months to do it all for the modulation scheme that we had chosen. And when, when I came, then I was told that I'm going to start taking some of this stuff over, and I could basically do uh, the same thing, but then we were doing a different modulation. Um, I decided I didn't want to have to do all of it in VHDL or in Verilog and in the FPGA, so I went the GNU Radio route and kind of got to talk about how I got from there to here. So first of all, I'm going to give you just an overview of the RFID work that we do and some of its applications, how it works, if you're unfamiliar with it, because it is relatively different than typical radio applications. Um, talk about some of the sensors we've worked on and some of the systems we've developed, and then talk about GNU Radio as a research um, and development and educational tool. I work with some undergraduate uh, researchers and advise them and kind of how GNU Radio has helped them in their understanding of radios and just some fundamental electrical engineering principles. Uh, I'll conclude then, and then I just tested the demonstration, so hopefully that will work. It just worked five minutes ago, so I'll try and give you one of those, too. So first of all, where is RFID? These are a bunch of different pictures of applications in RFID. It's kind of been around since actually all the way back to Leon Theremin. It was actually used in an analog sense as the Great Seal Bug, if you're familiar with that. So they actually use an RFID tag, um, a primitive form of that, in the U.S. Embassy. Um, and when the Russians would drive by, then they would point an antenna and blast, I think I saw the numbers at one point, but it was something like 10 kilowatts of power into the U.S. Embassy, and then via an, um, a microphone that just analogly um, modulated the, the sound waves coming on, sent that back so they could listen for it. And when the U.S. went in to try to figure out where it was, they couldn't uh, figure that out. Other than that, um, nowadays in toll, uh, toll lanes, um, logistical tracking, tracking excuse me, is one of the uh, biggest things we see. Um, there's actually a, a club in Spain where you can get an RFID tag implanted in you to use as your tab so you don't have to make a credit card. Um, also, for, I worked on this project too. This is called Trigger Smart. It's an RFID enabled handgun, so it's locked if you don't have a bracelet or a ring, which enables you to use it and then will unlock when uh, it comes in the proximity. So basically, RFID is getting it everywhere for a variety of reasons. Kind of how it works, which will kind of lead into the reasons. Um, unlike typical radio systems, the RFID tag um, for what I'm going to talk about are going to be called semi-passive or passive. So semi-passive tags, there is a battery on board, but there is um, no energy used. There's no energy transmitted. It relies on something called backscatter modulation to communicate with the reader. And what that means is you have an RFID reader, which will then send a continuous waveform to the RFID tag. In, in most cases. Then what the RFID tag does is then by means of changing um, the load on its antenna, it will reflect that and then it can modulate the data coming back. This is kind of akin to changing the radar cross-section of the tag. So if you would say I have a 50 ohm load on my antenna and it's matched, it's going to absorb everything and look very, very small from a radar perspective. If I then change that to an open circuit or a short circuit, it's going to look relatively large. So then via means like that, we can then communicate back with the RFID reader. The benefits of that, from an RF front end perspective, you can use down to, in literature it's quoted, 15.5 picojoules per bit of, of energy to uh, communicate back. So far, far less than using Zigbee or Bluetooth or many other low power techniques. Uh, when it's sent back then too, then you can do all of your typical demodulation um, in your reader. So RFID is used in a variety of frequencies um, listed here. Most of the work is done in, in the 800 to 900 megahertz region, depending where you are. Um, different countries have different, different regulations for that. These lower frequencies are typically inductively coupled, so they use magnetic field lines, sort of like a transformer, to send data back and forth, and those are then limited to about the size of the antenna. Uh, 
So the biggest ones I've seen are for marathons. They'll basically put a big antenna over the finish gates, and then when you run through it, it knows the exact time you finished. And the work we're actually doing is up here at 5.8 gigahertz. So there's not a lot of work in RFID done there, but there are a bunch of benefits due to the smaller size, some of the regulations, and how some of the laws are written uh, for RFID, which you can take advantage of. And when I'm talking about RFID, I, don't not, I not only mean RFID as in tracking and identification, which most people talk about, but also getting into RFID-enabled sensors and wireless sensor networks. Because these things are so um, low power, and because they're so basic, they can be very, very cheap and very, very small. So we're sort of getting closer and closer to the smart dust concept that the DOD talked about a few years ago. So th there's been a couple examples of this in literature. The Intel WISP is a 900 megahertz um, RFID-enabled sensor, which uses the, the Gen 2 protocol. There's a GE chemical sensor here, which uses um, different sorts of um, nanoparticles that are spread over an antenna to do detuning to sense the different chemical vapors. And actually, another project we worked on, this CMD2 sensor, it works in high-voltage environments at 5.8 gigahertz and then senses current on the line. So like I said, RFIDs are very cheap and very simple, and then the idea would be to deploy hundreds of these, thousands of these in an environment to sense something. And you can, you can then have both spatial information, identification information, and then some other sensor information you may, you may want. Uh, sort of one of the more interesting radio aspects of this so your transmitter in this arrangement, which is called bi-static, one transmitter receiving, or one antenna receiving, one transmitting, you're sending information out to the tag, and this is the data we want, this path right here. But you're also going to get different effects of the radio channel from bouncing off other objects. So this is going to be an unmodulated backscatter, which we don't want. And also, there's a lot of power coming here going directly into that antenna. So we don't want that. So because of that, that leads us to use certain R front ends, which typically don't want to use in most other applications. But I'll talk about that a little bit more later. So sort of the, sort of the motivation here, there's a lot of diff different technologies we want to explore in RFID, whether that be the R front ends, whether it be from a protocol, um, communication points of view, different types of sensors, and a lot of them, because they are so small and cheap, but cheap in large quantities, things get to be very hardware specific because um, things have to be so low power and you need to tune it, an RFID tag to use a certain amount of energy to com complete its task. So because of all those different things on the tag, that changes the software on the reader a lot, or the hardware that's implemented in hardware. So what we're looking at doing is trying to be able to streamline this process of development for RFID tags <clears throat> at both 5.8 and all other frequencies on both the tag side as well as the reader side. So kind of getting into the reader side first, why GNU Radio? Um, a lot of these reasons are kind of already talked about why GNU Radio is useful. But for us specifically, uh, we are an EMAG laboratory. Uh, we don't want to go through developing a lot of basic DSP blocks or spending nine months developing an FPGA software. So GNU Radio automatically has a lot of the tools which we already need. And we want to be able to dem demonstrate this and show prototypes to potential um, sponsors and clients. So we want to be able to do this quickly because our graduate student time is very expensive and we don't want to waste all the valuable resources that we have. We're, not, we're, we're really cheap. It was sort of supposed to be a joke. But. Also, uh, it's much easier to debug um, GNU Radio than it is FPGAs. Um, much more flexible. A lot of times you want to change our modulation several times in our development cycle. And if we would have told the student who spent nine months getting the one modulation to work, we wanted to change the modulations halfway through, he probably would have gone out and quit on us. Uh, reusable, too. I've used the, the code I developed for three or four different sensing applications and just had to change the modulation which when I told my advisor I can just change one letter in my code and modulation changes, he was ecstatic. Uh, low latency da data processing, being able to show demos with relatively real time. And also the problem that there isn't much commercial off the shelf 5.8 gigahertz RFID system, so we have to develop everything in house, um, our RF front ends, our tags, but that gives us a lot of flexibility and some room to explore more efficient ways of doing things from an RFID sensing perspective. So getting back to the tag, this kind of implementation might look familiar. Uh, this here is called the REST, is what I've named it, the RFID-enabled sensing test bed. And what this is, it basically takes all the parts of an RFID tag and puts it on a motherboard, and then allows you to interchange uh, between different ports, different parts of the RFID tag you might be working on. So you could, for instance, have your 5.8 gigahertz RFID front ends, and also you could have a UHF tag 
on their two. So you can communicate at two frequencies at the same time or just keep improving one um, tag here. You could also then experiment with, instead of BPSK, going between two different modulation states, go between, say, 64, QAM, you could even do, just by changing this one card and leaving everything else the same to see what the effect of your new type of modulation is on the system while out, without changing everything. Most of what we've done, since we're working at 5.8 gigahertz, is changing the different sensors we have. I'll talk about some of those later, but we also have some other uh, antenna um, technologies that, that we've worked on and use this platform from an RFID tag perspective to start uh, demonstrating our different capabilities. So while, while we're not using a USRP for this, this is getting closer and closer to eventually, once you have a good design here, making it into an ASIC, which would be the ultimate goal because they're so much more power efficient and we're really concerned about power. So a quick picture of what this looks like, the rest, and I have one here with me too. I'm going to come up and take a look later. So you can see we have four different identical daughter board slots. They're all the same pin connections, so you can develop uh, different daughter boards to go in all those. Uh, programming ports, a couple of LEDs and buttons, and then some ways to handle the power so you can measure how much power each daughter board is using because you really want to minimize all of this, as well as your microcontroller. You really need to minimize how much power it's going to draw based on the instruction set that you give it. A couple of the daughter boards we developed, so when I talk about the RF, RF uh, front end being simple, all it is here, um, both of these, is an RF switch, a couple of DC block capacitors, and then two loads. In this case, we have a short circuit and an open circuit. So very, very simple RF front ends. Um, so you don't have to do a lot of work on them really at all besides once you, once you get them electromagnetically matched. So we've had um, undergrads and other grad students come in and in their first semester start building these things because they are rel relatively simple. Uh, we've also made uh, different temperature sensor boards, gas sensing arrays, which I unfortunately can't show you, um, but they use carbon nanotubes and other nanomaterial structures to do trace chemical vapor detection down to the parts per billion and hundreds of parts per trillion range. Um, also another card here, which another student made, um, that's a motion capture board, which has an accelerometer and a gyrometer on it so we can measure motion in uh, all six axes. So if you take all those parts and combine them with the rest, it sort of looks like this. And based on the code that you write on the microcontroller, you can make it very interoperable by adding and subtracting these different pieces. So you basically have a full RFID tag right here. While this is very large, it really helps to streamline development. So then when you do have this working right, then you can port it to a much smaller design, which I also brought some of those with me, that is just doing one certain purpose. But now by this point, you had most of the bugs worked out in your hardware and your software. And while this is a semi-passive tag, um, you can eventually port this to a passive tag so there's no battery at all and you're scavenging all your energy off the waveform you're sending to interrogate your RFID tags from. Quick bit on the tag software. Um, again, very simple and most of what um, of our energy goes towards is calculated in the CRC for our error checking and we actually reduced this down to an 8-bit CRC because otherwise our tag was transmitting too long and it took too much energy. So that was one part we had to get into then, get into the GNU radio and change a 32-bit CRC that's included to an 8-bit CRC to help um, alleviate some of the, the, the demand on our microcontroller on the RFID tag. So if we talk about the whole system, which I actually have down here, I'm going to demo in a bit. Um, like I said, we have a bi-static system, one transmit antenna, one receive antenna, and then our own, own custom R front end, we're using just the LFRX daughter card from Edis. And the reason we went with this, one, we already had it. A PhD student had designed it for this application about five years ago. And the biggest thing is it just has a very, very large dynamic range because we have that problem where you need to be able to um, sense backscatter information. So it uses the radar equation. So signals fall off as one over R to the fourth. So we need to be able to take very, very small signals while still having another antenna basically screaming in our ear while trying to hear some guy all the way in the back of the room. Um, we're also, for this, Task using Manchester encoded BPSK, which I'll talk about why we're doing that a little bit later, and a custom telecom pro protocol. We're not using the EPC Global Gen 2 because we didn't feel that was really suitable for uh, RFID sensing applications. There was just too much overhead um, built into the protocol to be low enough power for our, our application. So this is the block diagram of the RR front end. It's a simplified version. Uh, the biggest thing here is uh, this system is 
fully coherent. It's the same oscillator for the transmitter and for our uh, receiver here. And also we have DC blocking capacitors, and that's really what helps us cancel out that unmodulated backscatter. So even though I have a guy yelling in my ear, I'm basically canceling him out by having these DC blocking capacitors. And that's why we're not using um, a super, homo, uh, super heterodyne receiver. We're using a homodyne or direct down conversion receiver. Getting a little bit more into the code, uh, this is very similar to the, the benchmark uh, QT loopback is what I eventually um, decided to base this off of, except I removed a frequency recovery because that, that actually ended up making the performance of the system worse because it was introducing some um, sinusoidal components into it. Um, other than that, um, there were some parts we had to go into and modify in, um, in the C++ files because they basically the added flexibility that it gave us was actually hurting us because we had to include more information into our um, header, which we tried to shrink down as much as possible to make our data packet as small as possible for, again, the same overhead reasons we talked about before. So just a quick screenshot of what it looks like. So we have two different tags here. Um, usually they're mounted in helmets, but I just have the tags here. And then we have, on each of them, a three-axis accelerometer and a three-axis gyrometer. The accelerometer works between plus and minus 16 Gs. And the gyrometer, I think, is plus and minus 1,500 degrees per second, if I remember right. And we're transmitting about 220 packets per second. And I, I can't recall what the, the length of the packet is, but it was in the, up in the previous slide. But this will hopefully be demoed live later. So talking about GNU Radio as a research tool. So the backscatter channel, like I said, is unique. On the forward end, um, it's pretty much the same as a traditional radio channel. But on the back end, we have product Rayleigh fading. And that does some interesting things to our data when it comes back. And what our um, noise looks like in our receiver, when we actually sample it, looks kind of like this. So we notch out the middle because it's a direct down conversion. And then we have our flicker noise and our thermal noise on my typical. Um, so what I said before, we use Manchester encoding. The reason we do that is if you're familiar with, or sorry, um, Miller encoding is what we're actually using. Um, Miller and Manchester are sort of similar. Miller is basically a Manchester symbols repeated a couple times. And what that does is that allows us to almost introduce an artificial IF due to our encoding. So instead of having all of our information right here where we have a lot of noise and a notch out, we're actually shifting our data packets out here to the thermal noise. So that allows us to increase our SNR dramatically and improve our range by almost an order of magnitude. Um, other things, like I said, different sensor developments. So while the, the basic code is the same, we'll want to change our modulation depending on the power draws of the sensor and how that affects the RFID tag and the range and the, the data rate we're sending it back and how often we're sending information back. So all that will be, have to be changed um, depending on the sensor. Um, passive multiple axis, which we'll talk about here in a second, how you can do that. Um, also, the cognitive radio sensing. And also, a way to simulate this and then both demonstrate it as a real-world real application to get some funding from a, a sponsor to show that, yes, we do know what we're doing. We can make these sensors. We just need to work on this part now. So kind of getting into more of what my actual PhD research is related to is this thing called a power-optimized waveform, or it's also been called multi-science before. Now, the reason we're doing this, so typically we use just CW, just one frequency sent out in most RFID systems. And that's probably the, the worst thing you can actually do for RF energy harvesting. Because since these tags are passive, we need to power them up with this waveform. And what it turns out to be in the RF energy harvester is we need to bypass a diode threshold. I thought about putting a circuit diagram up here, but I, I decided against it because uh, I wasn't sure how the software community would feel about that. This is my first software conference, so I'm kind of getting used to, to this. But what this does actually for us, instead of using CW, we use multiple signs. So the total power of this waveform here in the green and the blue is the same, but the peak to average power is much, much larger. And while most radio systems don't want that, um, there's actually some OFDM research that wants to decrease this because they get this as a byproduct. But this is actually what's helping, helping us extend our range and our reliability of our passive RFID tags, because this large spike in power allows us to trip our diodes in our RF energy harvesting circuit, which allows us to extend the range. Also, what this does is it, it makes it more reliable, because if there's fading in the channel, instead of having one carrier that gets knocked out due to interference or due to some fading, we have multiple carriers here, which we can then use 
to improve that um, not only from power, but also in the, in the reliability. What we can also do then, too, is depending on the design of this waveform, you can spread out each tag can communicate on one subcarrier. So we can do a passive multiple axis where all tags could simultaneously harvest from all these subcarriers, but then only communicate on one of them. Um, kind of talking back to the cognitive radio, um, so we will design a waveform which I want to arrive at the tag in this form, but because of fading, maybe some of the subcarriers will be attenuated or slightly out of phase. So then we can actually use things like the USRP to do some cognitive radio and channel sounding first and then dynamically adjust the phases and the amplitudes of the subcarriers so that we'll arrive at the tag at a way we want it to. Because then it'll be the most efficient, we'll have the most power on the tag and it can most efficiently communicate with the reader. Um, some of the disadvantages generating this is an issue. I'm just trying to get an amplifier which won't saturate or basically generating a lot of these subcarriers individually and then combine them at high power RF later is an issue getting them all to be all in phase. And then how do we demodulate this? If you look at one subcarrier, that's fine, but if we only have one, it's weaker power, and it will actually make the RFID system be back channel or back scatter limited instead of forward channel. So instead of not having enough power to turn it on, we'll actually become sensitivity limited at the receiver. Uh, just for some of this notation here, um, this is a four power, so we have four subcarriers here, and we have CW. So when I talk here next, talking about the efficiency improvements, you can see blue is CW, and then we start adding subcarriers, one, two, and three. And this energy harvester is almost about 50% efficient at high powers, but you see as you decrease powers, you become very, very inefficient. So if you look down here at minus 10 dBm, at CW, we only have about 250 nanowatts of power there where if we had one subcarrier, we get one microwatt. So very, very small amounts of power, but we can then use that, bank it in the capacitor, and have enough energy to do something useful. So this is only going up to three pow because we have problems with our, some of our hardware in generating more than three pow, but we can go up to 64 pow, 100 pow. Really, it's limited by your bandwidth, which you have, your subcarrier spacing, and ultimately your um, power amplifiers and your um, um, LNAs on your receiver. So talking briefly about um, Uni Radio as an educational tool, uh, th this is a problem uh, I talked about before. By We had to figure out to take out the frequency recovery blocks of introducing th these noise issues. And sort of the nice thing for me about Uni Radio was being able to basically export the waveform at every single stage of the demodulating chain and finding out where the problem was. That was something where before when our uh, students ran into this problem, they didn't really have an idea of where it was because they had to go through every single bit, every single piece of um, the FPGA and find out where, was, where, where this was. But this, I mean, we solved the problem much faster and trying to, to teach someone how do you get from IQ data, constellation data, which I typically think of when I design receivers, to actually getting a bit or you can kind of think of it in your head how it would work, but how does a receiver actually implement that, and what are the trade-offs then in your modulation, and how it's implemented, and how, how you can improve that. Also having uh, students work on just a small part of this project, so it's a very complicated system in the software, the hardware, but a student can just take one small part, say develop a new sensor, and then with just minimal modification and the code on the REST platform and in the GNU radio, they can get their whole system working much, much easier than developing a system from the, from the ground up. So it really helps them give a sense of accomplishment that they're actually doing something useful instead of worrying about trying to get a whole system working, which they couldn't do in a lot of senior design projects. Sort of in conclusion here before I do the demo, uh, GNU Reader does provide a flexible platform for developing RFID technologies in both hardware and in software. I didn't talk much about the communication and the protocol developments because that's not really my area, but it certainly adds to that as a, uh, we talked about yesterday. Uh, research labs, I know I use it on um, people in the industry. It's transitioning to hobbyists and then just instruction on, on how does a new radio, how can it break down the parts of a radio chain and a receiver to help instruct undergrads and graduate students how a radio works. And this modular nature is really, really nice, just being able to take piece by piece away and interchange one small part of it and seeing how that affects your whole system performance instead of having to swap out a whole tag that has a different, um, different RF front end, which might not be soldered correctly, 
or there's problems on the microcontroller, just being able to change one small part really helped us with sensor development and system development as a whole. Uh, some quick acknowledgments. Um, I'm part of the propagation group at Georgia Tech. Uh, I also work, I forgot to mention, with GTRI in the Electro-Optic Systems Laboratory, doing some sensor work there. Um, I have a Shackford Fellowship from GTRI and Thingamajigger Works and this NF NSF career grant helped support this project. I'd also like to thank uh, Marcin Mores, Bashir Akbar for their help in developing some of this stuff and my advisor, Greg Durgan. So I'm gonna get the demo set up really quick here, but if you have any questions, you can either ask me or write down my email address. And I'm gonna hope this demo is going to work. Any questions in the meantime? This was supposed to be on design marine proof is what my instructions were, and apparently I'm not smarter than a marine. Here's our GUI. And I have a couple tags here. So we should see them both. We shake them around. You'll see motion here if you want to. Mm -hmm. Hold one, too. It's polarized uh, that way. Uh, yeah. Net axis. So yours is receiving. This is the black helmet, and that one's the white helmet. So you see some of that, but any questions? So the range is very dependent. Um, these are semi-passive tags, and on our normal antennas we use them. Just using some small ones here, but we get about thirty meters of range semi-passively. So there's th three classes of RFID tags. The question was, what do I mean, I mean by semi-passive? An active RFID tag transmits data actively with um, an R front end on the tag. A semi-passive tag uses a battery to power the microcontroller and any sensors on it, but does not use any energy for backscatter communication. And a passive tag gets all of its energy from the incoming waveform. So it uses the waveform for both power and for communication. Yeah, so the accelerometers on here are actually very high power because of the, the specifications by the sponsor. And I, I think the accelerometers here use about 7 milliamps, and then the R front end uses under uh, 100 microamps. You're, you're holding the antenna, so it's probably detuned. Any other questions? Yes? Uh, there's no protocol standard in this. Um, the EPC Gen 2 um, standard relies on a lot of acknowledgments and talking between the reader and the tag. And we're eventually going to port this to a passive design. And every time you have to do that um, protocol, you need to power up an analog to digital converter, which takes up a lot of energy on the tag. So there's a lot of overhead to get data back. So actually what these are using now is just a low hop protocol because it's a low number of tags. But eventually we, we would go to using multiple subcarriers, like when I talked about the POWs. You, they can each backscatter by themselves on one. There's also some different coding techniques 
um, sort of like CDMA you can use so it can simultaneously transmit back on the same frequency. So it's very application dependent on a lot of what we do. No, there's no EPC on these. They're basically um, s sampling the sensors, encoding them, and then backscattering back the data and just going over and over again because we have a very high uh, demand for data coming back. You're welcome. It, so um, concussion detection is ultimately the goal because they have a lot of helmets now, which you can get, but they're $1,000 for the, each helmet, and then the system's $20,000. Where this school, you can make one of these tags as they are now for about five dollars, and then this system wouldn't cost you more than four thousand dollars, and that's in small numbers. You make it in bulk, and then the price will drop dramatically. So instead of a thirty-meter range in the current configuration, but we have not optimized a lot of the components on it. So ultimately, you'd be able to not market this only to professionals and colleges, but down the high school and PB levels, because you don't have to invest a hundred thousand dollars in a system for the whole team. So, so what Tom was just saying, you can see there's an offset on the gyrometer. That's something which is a product of the gyrometer itself. There's, um, in the MEMS, offsets, which are supposed to be correctable, but we haven't quite figured out how to do that. If you have more questions about that, you can talk to Bashir. He's back there somewhere, and he can, he can t talk to you about fixing that. <laughs> and it's still working. It hasn't broken yet. Anything else? Thank you all very much.